Mary Roach, how did Elvis die? Well, there are different theories, but my belief, based on research from my book, is that uh, he was a victim of severe constipation and uh, defecation associated sudden death. How did you find that out? I found that out, well, one fine day, I was talking to somebody uh, at the, uh, here in DC, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, their museum, they have a mega colon, <coughs> which is a monstrous colon, huge, uh, it uh, suggests some severe difficulties, uh, internal difficulties, anyway, mega colon, the woman happened to say to me, Elvis Presley died of that, and I went, what? <laughs> and uh, that one thing led to another, and I spent a, a day with Elvis Presley's doctor and learned about uh, the King's troubles with severe uh, constipation. Who was his doctor? Nick, Dr. Nick Nicopoulos. And yeah. what was that visit like? Uh, it, that was, it was lovely. It was uh, the, the anniversary of Elvis's death. There's always a, a, a gathering of all of Elvis's hardcore fans who all come to Graceland in Memphis, so they were all milling around. Dr. Nick was doing a memorial tribute, uh, and then I went over to his house, which is the house that Elvis uh, had built for him way back when in the 70s. And Dr. Nick and I sat around uh, in the living room of this wonderful 1970s, at the time, very, very posh place. Great big rooms, and uh, we sat there, uh, Dr. Nick here and uh, his wife, Edna, and Edna would be, uh, the furniture was quite far apart, and I would lean, and try to lean down to put my coffee, I'd have to get up slightly to get the coffee cup down, and um, Dr. Nick and I talked about Elvis, and every now and then, every now and then Edna from, <laughs> would pop up with an observation or a comment about uh, Priscilla Presley or something, it'd be this little dispatch from the distant island nation of Edna. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn from Dr. Nick? <clears throat> well, I was there to talk about, uh, well, you know, Gulp, I should explain to people, Gulp is, uh, the subtitle is Adventures on the Alimentary Canal, so it's uh, everything from nose to tail, and this chapter had to do with uh, constipation and this whole notion of, uh, is it possible to, uh, is it possible to die of constipation, and, and, uh, do, and you do hear sometimes about people who've died upon the toilet, uh, the throne, you know, uh, which I guess would be appropriate with Elvis. But anyway, so I was interested in this uh, notion because everybody, uh, most people assume it was, it was drugs, that it was an overdose that killed Elvis and in fact um, he certainly took a lot of drugs and that didn't help but the actual moment of death as far as uh, I could tell from the autopsy, from the, 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 the cause of death was, uh, was a fatal heart arrhythmia which can come on when somebody is pushing, straining at stools. So the moment of death would appear to have been uh, defecation associated. So it fit right in with the book and I thought, well, I need to talk to Dr. Nick, uh, who is a lovely, gracious man in his 80s now, and uh, invited me in and we sat around and had coffee and chatted about uh, <laughs> Elvis and constipation and things. And Where did you get the idea to write Gulp? <laughs> Gulp is so Roachable, you know, it's uh, I, I, it's just kind of a, a wonder I didn't write about this topic before. You know, it's it's kind of a taboo subject, and I I'm I enjoy writing about taboo topics that, just particularly that relate to the human body. Be, uh, partly because it's fun to play with taboo, because everybody stays away from it. Therefore, uh, all the more for me to play with. I'm kind of the bottom feeder of nonfiction, so he's like, I'll take that. You don't want to do that? I'll do it. I'll do it. And, be, and because it's taboo, I think people, anything that's taken away and made taboo, uh, people are secretly fascinated with. Uh, you know, it's kind of like somebody says, you know, you're on a diet that you can't have any desserts or whatever it is, then that's the thing you crave. So there, people are both repulsed and drawn to it, and they kind of want to peek behind the curtain. So I'm here pulling the curtain apart for people. and. I also, with, I think uh, some, when it's your own body that you're talking about, the taboo does us a disservice because sometimes people have health concerns and issues that they don't feel comfortable even talking to their doctor about, like the, the Elvis Presley's problems. Those are, those are things that, <clears throat> because it's taboo, people don't want to bring it up. They feel embarrassed, you know. Uh, constipation is an embarrassing thing to talk about. In so. the close of Gulp, you write, there is an unnameable feeling I've had maybe 10 times in my life. 
It is a mix of wonder, privilege, humility, and awe that borders on fear. I felt it in a field of snow on the outskirts of Fairbanks, Alaska, with the northern lights whipping overhead so seemingly close, I dropped to my knees. I am walloped by it on dark nights in the mountains, looking up at the sparkling smear of our galaxy. What experience were you having when you wrote this? Or what, what made you have that feeling? Well, uh, I decided to get my first colonoscopy without any drugs because I wanted to see you know, what, what it looked like in there because my feeling was this is, this is your own body and here is this opportunity, this very, very rare opportunity to see the, these miraculous parts of you that are day in and day out keeping you alive and doing these uh, amazing things. And I thought, okay, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to observe this. I'm going to see my own colon. And I expected to feel the emotions that uh, I'm describing there in the passage that you just read, um, when in fact I felt <coughs> mild to moderate cramping. <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that had been my hope, that it would be this kind of uh, transcendent experience. of, And it was actually very, uh, it was an amazing thing to witness, however the intermittent sharp pain and <laughs> discomfort kind of distracted me from my goal of lofty feelings. Mary Roach, there is a National Museum of Health and Medicine here in Washington. What's there? That's the megacolon, the home of the megacolon, which inspired the trip to Memphis to visit with uh, Dr. Nick, Elvis's, uh, Elvis's physician, personal physician for many years. So that's the, the, the megacolon that, that brought on this whole uh, chapter. What does bonk mean? Bonk is slang for sexual intercourse. I have to say, though, you're going to get people are going to start to call in, going, "Excuse me, I believe that you've misspelled the title of your own book. It is boink, not bonk." Uh, to which I reply, "Yeah, okay, there. It is both. Bonk is a little more common in the UK. It's, in fact, that's what people say in the UK. But where I, I grew up in New England, and I, we would say bonk, bonk. And, and to me, boink is a silly word, boink. And bonk is like it's like a, it's an onomatopoeia, I'm a bonk." So that's why uh, I, I chose bonk, but people to this day will write to me and say, P.S., I think it's boink, actually, as though like that made it past the editor, the copy editor, and like, nobody noticed that the title had been misspelled. But enough people complained that I had made up for book tours um, a little yellow letter I, because the, the text uh, on, on the cover of the paperback is yellow. So I had a little peel and stick letter I that I would have a little um, bowl of that people could take and apply to the cover of their book if it really bothered them that I had uh, <coughs> used bonk instead of boink. What did you research in that book? Uh, bonk is a book about sex labs and when I say sex labs I'm saying this is a book about people brave souls who does who studied the physiology of sex meaning uh, not gender stuff or sociology or, or HIV transmission or uh, but specifically just the the biomechanics uh, and the physiology of arousal orgasm intercourse so people just saying okay this is a system a human system and it deserves like any other human system to be studied and understood and for centuries nobody did that uh, and it wasn't until the, uh, like, well, Masters and Johnson got it and Kinsey got it rolling in earnest. But it's really till the uh, 40s and 50s, nobody wanted to go there. So I, I just look, I looked at people who went there, brave souls who went there. Uh, so that's what that book is about. How significant were the Masters and Johnson and uh, Kinsey studies? Uh, the, well, Kinsey was more, uh, what Kinsey's contributions had more to do with it. He had to do that extensive interviewing, he'd have people come in and do this long, not unlike this three hour interview, this long, he would do this extensive interview about what you know, sexual habits, what do you do, who do you do it with, how many times and in what position, uh, really very specific uh, personal questions about people's uh, sexuality. And he published these two volumes and, and that was quite controversial, the things that he uncovered. So that was mostly what Kinsey did. However, he did get interested, and in, we're talking then, this was the 40s and early 50s, and he did at one point bring people up into the attic of, uh, of, of his house in Indiana, and uh, the attic sessions were essentially him with a movie camera and a notepad 
observing, taking notes, and answering certain questions that he had, and, and studying the process of the, you know, the sexual response cycle, as it would come to be called. Uh, 